risen all my joy and strength my one hiding place all my hope displayed in the face of Jesus every fear will fall and every lie will break every doubt will fade when it's face with Jesus all my joy and strength my one hiding place so my You need impossible, something that you can't do. Your hope is running low, it's out of your control. You're praying help is coming soon. He knows your sorrow, hold your tomorrow. This is not the
Good morning. Happy Sunday. I hope that you are doing well. I hope God has blessed you this week, and uh, it's just good to see your face today. As we are uh, preparing for worship, there are just a few things that I want to point out to you. Um, Among those guests, we're glad that you're here. We want to know more about what is going on in your life and who you are. And so in our order of service, there is a little tear-off or a QR code in there. You can use either one of those. But could we just pull some of those off so we don't single anybody out? There you go, yeah. You don't want your guests to be the only ones going rip and everybody turns to look, you know. So um, if you would, this is a, a little sheet for prayer requests or ministries or whatever we can do to be a help. We want to do that. And so if you'd fill that out, you can just leave it in the pew on the cushion next to you or you can drop it in our offering baskets on your way out. The QR code will send an email immediately to the office. And so that is a help to us just to get to know who you are and what you want, what you're interested in. Um, another thing is the name tags. Uh, there should be a name tag in the pew rack in front of you, and so you can fill that out and put your name on it. And that just helps us as we're learning names. Uh, the red border name tags are people who have said, I will help you. So let me know what you need. And I'm wearing one, so you can let me know. Uh, and we'll help you find childcare or a cup of coffee or restrooms or whatever it is that you're looking for. In the order of service, there are a couple of uh, things that I want to call your attention to. One is the children's ministry, the Easter experience is coming up, so please pay attention to that. A second thing uh, that I'd like to call your attention to is the fact that today we are having a town hall meeting to talk about the church business administrator that we would like to hire. And I want you to understand what it is that we are looking for and I want to answer questions ahead of time and preferably outside business meeting where we have a little more time to talk. It's important, I want you to understand, especially because this church has had a business administrator in the past, but it was more of a secretarial position, and what I'm looking for is more of a leadership position, more like a pastor of business administration type thing. And so I just, I want to be clear on all of that, or at least as clear as possible. And so that's today at three o'clock. If you have any questions or comments, if you have input, we'd love for you to come and be a part of that so that we can talk those things through ahead of time. So hopefully you can be there and be a part of that. Lastly, but probably most importantly, we are continuing through our 40 days of prayer and we are approaching the Easter season And so we want you to be praying about Easter, about talking to friends and family members, inviting people to be a part of our Easter services. We want you to be preparing your heart as we will move into this time where we think about really the greatest event that God has ever done for us. And that is letting his son, Jesus Christ, come and pay the penalty for our sins so that we can be made right with him. I mean, that is what we celebrate in the Easter season. And it is so foundational. But I think we sometimes lose sight. We start thinking candy for the kids and Easter bunnies and all that kind of thing. And and we get a little distracted from the reason for this particular holiday. So we want to really just strive to bring that to life for you this season, this year. And so please be paying attention to that as we go. Let's take a minute and let's just pray as we begin worship today. Father, we love you. We are grateful for the things that you have done for us. We pray, help us right now just to be still and know that you are God. We ask that our worship of you not be contained or limited in this service of worship, but instead our very lives would be living sacrifices given over to you. We love you and we serve you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's all consuming, isn't it? The ocean takes up most of our planet. Fathom, if you will, just the enormity of it. It's raw, unhinged, effortless energy. It's the type of power, if we're not careful, that can sweep us away. It's kind of like money, isn't it? For success, for relationships, control, comfort, security. Because you see, in each one of our little worlds, we have this force. And this powerful force can overtake us. And if it does that, we basically crown it king of our lives. Yes, we give it power. Let me give you another visual. First century Jerusalem, it's Passover, and a man rides into town, not on a horse, but on a donkey, and the crowd goes nuts. He doesn't look like a king, but the crowd has already proclaimed him to be just that. They are uh, waving palm branches, they're throwing down their cloaks, because they had already decided and believed that he was the one foretold by scriptures, that he was the Messiah. But the throne of power that was placed upon Jesus that day was not the throne that he came to sit upon. You see, nobody understood on the road to Jerusalem the suffering that he would endure for their sake and for ours as well. He would be crowned, but with thorns. But don't you understand that Jesus is the king? He is the king that gives sight to the blind. He is the king that walks on water. He is the king that says, even if you do not worship me, the rocks will cry out and praise my name. Oh yes, he is the king. And now that you've caught a glimpse of the enormity of his power, you must decide and deliberate if Jesus will be king of your life. And as for me, Jesus is my king! All hail the power of Jesus' name.
He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter, and as sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth.
Amen. I hope your soul is crying out praise and honor to God. Uh, let me just ask anybody, who in here got up on time this morning? Yeah? Oh, oh man, we are doing pretty good. I, you know, th these time changes, they throw everybody for a loop. And so I'm impressed. But, you know, I shouldn't be all that impressed because you're here. <laughs> the people who are like, the alarm is now going off, they're going, they're going to be here in time for Sunday school ready for worship. Um, I'm glad that you're here. Would you turn your Bibles to John chapter 8, and we're going to begin in verse 48. John 8, 48 is our passage for today. I read a, a true story recently. This lady comes into the grocery store, and it's, it's a local grocery store, and the assistant manager comes up to her and says, listen, you are in big trouble because you're not wearing your uniform, you're here late, and you left early for work. And the assistant manager just tears into her and is like, you're coming with me. Come on back here. And she takes her back into this room, kind of back in the back, this office. And, um, and she just sort of lays into her. And the lady's like, let me explain. And the assistant manager just will not hear of it. She just keeps after her, keeps after her, keeps after her. And she goes, hang on. We're, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm calling the store owner. And so she gets on the phone or whatever. And the lady in the office is like, that's enough of this. And she slips out. Well, the assistant manager goes after her. So out in the store in front of everybody, she gets this lady by the arm and starts pulling her back toward the office. And the lady, being a little bigger and stronger, pulls away from her and is like, listen, I just need to tell you. And she goes, I don't want to hear it. You know, this laziness, this bad attitude that you have. And the assistant manager is just tearing into her. So that she gets her back into the main room. They get the, the owner of the company comes in. And now finally somebody is willing to listen. The owner says, all right, what's going on? What's all the fuss? What's the problem here? And the lady says, I don't work here. <laughs> she just looked like somebody that they had hired before. Like, have you ever had somebody that that insulted you or said false things about you or, or didn't treat you the way that they should treat you. Anybody in here ever had that happen before? All right. The reason I'm talking about these things is because Jesus faced those kinds of things as well, where he is wrongly accused, particularly in this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today. And so we've been studying through the book of John, and things are getting more tense for Jesus. There is more of this kind of harsh interaction between him and these religious people, these religious leaders, and they keep saying things that are just sort of out of bounds. Um, Jesus continues to call them on the carpet because of their hypocrisy, and even though he is speaking truth, even though they don't have any charges against him, even though he seems innocent of all wrong, the, these religious people don't believe the things that Jesus says. And he's pretty directly questioning in them. If I'm not guilty, if I haven't done wrong, if I'm not out of bounds then what's the problem? Why don't you believe the things I'm telling you? In our passage of scripture last week, Jesus concluded... Because God is not really your father. You're operating because Satan is your father. That's why you're believing lies. That's why you're moving in a wrong direction spiritually and you're so offended by the truth. Let me just tell you, that is probably not a real popular conversation, right? So in today's passage, that same conversation is continuing. This is John 8, beginning in verse 48. So let's read that. The Jews answered him. What are they answering? Let's go back to verse 47 real quick. He who belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Jesus is saying this to some very religious type people. The Jews answered him, 48, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed. So Jesus goes, hey, here's the problem. You don't really belong to God. And their response is, oh, yeah? Well, you're a Samaritan and you're demon-possessed. 
So what does that mean? What are we talking about? When they call him a Samaritan, so there is a, a region that is close to where Jesus is, and these people were Samaritans. They were people who were half Jewish and half other, right? Gentile or from other nations. Um, Assyria came in and some of the Jewish people intermixed with the Assyrians and that was a major problem for Jewish people because God had called them to spiritual purity and over time I believe that spiritual purity got confused for racial purity and so now what they're doing basically is they're using a racial slur toward Jesus they're they're saying you don't live up to our expectations so now this this has been a little bit debated there there's another possibility about what they're saying here the word Samaritan also sounds like the name of a demon that um, that is very closely related to Samaritan so there is the possibility that what they could be saying is you are a demon and you are demon possessed and that is the issue People think that because in the following verse, Jesus does not address the race thing at all. He only addresses the whole demon-possessed thing. I think, personally, they're actually calling him a Samaritan, and he doesn't address it because he's not dignifying that with a response, and he just moves forward. Anyway, so let's keep reading. This is um, verse 49 and 50. I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. So Jesus doesn't say anything about the Samaritan comment as far as I can tell. He just says, I'm not demon possessed, but at this point you're just being insulting. You're just dishonoring me and ultimately my father who is the judge. And you should be concerned about that because God the Father, he is holding you. He, he'll be the one who judges you and your heart and your life and how you behave. So, so they basically are bringing this wrong sort of indictment, this not accusation, but just really insult against Jesus. And we learn some things as a result of that. Jesus teaches the people. One of the things is don't dishonor Jesus or maybe to put it in a positive way, honor God the Father and honor God the Son. There is this um, great passage of scripture in Mark chapter 12 where um, some of the religious leaders, again, are trying to trap Jesus. And so they ask him, they go, oh man, Jesus, you know, you're so smart, you're so wise. Let me just ask you, should we pay the imperial tax? And it's a trap because the Jewish people have been taken over by the Romans. And so the imperial tax is a tax that goes straight to the Romans. Well, the Jewish people don't like that. They don't want some other government telling them what they have to do. So they are resistant to it. They are hesitant to do those kinds of things. If Jesus says yes, you should pay the imperial tax, then he's in trouble with the people because they're all going to be like, what? We're supposed to support this government who's coming in here and imposing themselves on us? But if Jesus says, no, don't pay the taxes, then those religious people are going to go to the government and they're going to go, hey, what are you going to do about this Jesus? He's inciting the people to rebel against the government. You know, let's lock him up. Let's do something with him. What Jesus says is, can I have a coin? And so they bring him a denarius, right? And, and he holds that coin and he says, whose face, whose image is printed on the coin? Now, uh, the coin would not have looked just like this, but it would have been similar to it. And the people looked at it and they said, well, that's Caesar's face. That's Caesar's image. And so Jesus says, you should give what belongs to Caesar to Caesar. And you should give what belongs to God to God. 
Now, we have heard that so many times, I think we, it has lost its brilliance on us, right? Familiarity breeds contempt. You get used to hearing something and you just don't realize what an amazing answer that is. When Jesus started talking about an image, what do you suppose sprung to the mind of good Jewish people? We are created in the image of God. Genesis tells us that. And so what Jesus is saying is, you should pay your taxes. Give to the government what the government deserves. But your life, every part of who you are, is created in the image of God. And so give that to God. Like, that is a little bit mind-blowing, isn't it? Because we have this tendency to be like, I'll take this quarter and I'll throw it in the offering plate when it comes by. A little spare change, right? Instead of looking at everything I've got belongs to God. All of who I am, every breath I breathe, every heartbeat, they're all gifts to me from God. They are temporarily loaned to me, and God's interested in what I do with what he's given to me. That's a totally different way of looking at the world that you, in your entirety belong to him and you should give yourself to him a founder of the Salvation Army a guy named William Booth uh, Salvation Army has been around since the 1800s and originally it was set up as a way to share Jesus with people it wasn't just giving money to something it was teaching kids it was educating them helping them read and they would use the Bible in order to do that listen to what William Booth said I'll tell you a secret. God has had all of me that there was. There have been men with greater brains than I, even with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with me and them, on that day I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth that there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army, it is because God has had all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. What's your life look like? Can you say those same things? If somebody says something that you don't like, The way that you respond to that person says something about your relationship with God. The way that you react says something about how you interact with Almighty God. Is every part of your life a gift that you are giving back to God? Can I just tell you, I fail. I mean, I want to live up to God's standard. The Holy Spirit empowers me to be able to do that. But I still fall short. I still give God less than what he is due. Isn't it good that we have God's grace, that he forgives and redeems and reconciles the relationships that we have with him? Honor God with your life. Verse 51 continues here. It says, I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. So here's something else from this wrongful indictment, another teaching Jesus gives us. It basically is keeping Jesus' word is life. We have this uh, concept in our society, and I think largely due to Oprah Winfrey. Uh, she regularly has said and continues to say, speak your truth. Anybody ever heard that before? And, and what she's saying is, talk about things from your perspective. Talk about how you see it. Talk about what it's like in your life. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but it is a speak your truth with a little T, not a capital T. And what I mean by that is there are some truths that override your perspective, your 
provision, your, your way, the way that you're seeing the world. Uh, let me illustrate. Uh, there's this guy, Jonathan Pakluda. He's a pastor. This is his illustration. I'm just borrowing it. But he basically says, let's imagine for just a minute that you believe you can fly, right? You think about it. You meditate on it. You're like, I can, I can soar through the air like Superman. I can just jump, right? And I'm going to go. And so if you take your truth up to the top of a skyscraper and you jump, there's a bigger T truth, and it's gravity, and you are going to plummet regardless of what you see from your perspective or what you think. Yes? So uh, Pakluda, he talks about how he went on a mission trip, and his daughter was with him, and his daughter got gravely ill. She was just completely sick. She got this high fever. She really needed medical attention, and he was like, we got to get her home. And so they go to a, a foreign airport. They are catching a flight somewhere. But he's in, responsible for his daughter. He's stressed out already. He gets off of this plane, and he can't read any of the signs in this foreign airport. And he starts asking around for somebody who speaks English, and he can't find anybody, and so he starts to panic. So now imagine for just a minute that somebody walks up to him in that situation and says, What's going on? What do you need? And he goes, I got to get home. I got to get my daughter to some medical help. I don't know what to do. I can't read any of these signs. What do I need to do? What if they said, every terminal here leads to the United States? And he believed that, you know, and he goes, oh, man, thank you so much. And he and his daughter just got on one of the terminals, got on some plane. How would he feel if the plane touched down in Germany or Botswana or Japan or war-torn Ukraine? What if, what if instead of taking him home, that plane took him as far away from home as possible? He and his daughter could end up in a place where she could not get medical help that she needed and they could be way worse off. Now, in that case, telling them, Every terminal will take you wherever you want to go would not be a loving thing to say because it wouldn't be true. Capital T, truth. So now just imagine for a minute that instead he's in that same panic mode. He's looking around. He can't figure out where he's supposed to go. And somebody walks up to him and says, where are you going? And he says, the United States of America. And they go, oh, well, you need gate D16. That one is going to Atlanta, because when you die, you go through Atlanta, right? Everybody goes to Atlanta. D16, that one will take you to Atlanta. He might be grateful, but he might respond, how can you be so narrow-minded to say that there's only one way, only one place, right? I could get on any terminal. I could get on E35. I could get on D26. The response would be, I mean, yeah, you can get on any terminal you want to. But if you want to go home, D-16. That's the only one leading to the United States. Do you get where I'm going with all of this? The fact that Jesus shows up and says, I'm bringing you life. I am trying to be helpful and kind to you. I'm speaking truth. Even in the middle of a situation where the people are angry and hostile toward him, he is still saying this is loving and true. Christianity is true. Do you know how I know that? Because the Bible was written over the course of 2,000 years and it's a coherent whole like, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I can hardly get three people to give me the same opinion in a coherent whole, right? Three different ideas. You know, they say where three or more Baptists are gathered, four or more opinions are present, right? Like, it's, the Bible is this spectacular thing written by 36 different authors, and it is a coherent whole. Let me just tell you, if anybody comes along and they tell you, don't believe anything that any religion has ever taught you. If you want to know the truth, just do what I say. God speaks just to me. 
That's the stuff that cults are built on. If I was Almighty God and I wanted to make sure you understood who I was, I wouldn't limit anything to one person's lifetime. I would do it lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. For thousands of years, I would spend time making myself known to people. And that's exactly what we have in the scripture. Jesus fulfills all of these metaphors and prophecies and predictions and pictures of what it is that God is intending for us to do. And Jesus fulfills it all. Keeping his word is life. Verse 52 goes on here. It says, At this, the Jews exclaimed, Now we know you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Now, we're not exactly sure what he means by that. Abraham saw it. Did God give Abraham a vision of all that was to come? We know that he had a little bit of that. He understood some things were happening and that he looked forward to God fulfilling his promises. But to physically actually see it, I don't know if that is the case or not. What I do know is everything that happens in the Bible is a gigantic arrow pointing us to Jesus. Everything that happens. There is this guy, and his name is um, Sinclair Ferguson, and he's talking about a theology that is based on Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, uh, which is this idea that through one man, Adam, sin came in the world, but that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything. Through him, the sin of the world is taken care of, but he goes back through passages of Scripture. Listen to Sinclair's quote. He says, Jesus is the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out for our acquittal, not our condemnation. Jesus is the true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave the comfortable and familiar and to go to the void not knowing whither he went to celebrate a new people of God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac who was not just offered up by his father on the mount but was truly sacrificed for us all. God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me. Now we can say to God, now we know that you love us, because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. Jesus is the true and better Jacob who wrestled with God and took the blow of justice that we deserve. Like Jacob received only, excuse me, like Jacob, receiving only the wounds of grace to wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who, at the right hand of the king, forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. Jesus is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses, who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. I'm in that camp. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory 
It's for his people, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther who didn't risk losing an earthly palace but lost the ultimate heavenly one who didn't just risk his life but gave it to save his people. Jesus is a true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. Do you see what Sinclair is saying? Over and over again, all of these historical events that happened in the Bible happened as God's teaching tool for us so that we could understand what it was Jesus would do for us on the cross. That is something we should celebrate. There is a God who loves you so much that he would do all of these things throughout recorded history to make himself known to you. Rejoice in Jesus' coming. Verse 57 says, You're not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Out of this wrongful indictment, we should recognize who Jesus is. When he says, I am, he's associating himself with the God from the book of Genesis, book of Exodus, where Moses goes, how am I going to know there's all these gods, Egyptian gods, if the people say, who sent you, who am I supposed to say? And God says, the God of your forefathers, I am that I am, has sent you. And so when Jesus said that, they got it. They knew what he was saying. He's saying, I'm the great I am. They got it, and so they picked up stones thinking, this is blasphemy, we're going to kill this guy. But Jesus got away from them. A pastor named Joe White, he talked about how um, he got to know this guy, Imad, who was Muslim. And as they developed a friendship, um, Joe asked him questions about his faith. He says, Imad, according to your faith, what happens to you when you die? And Imad said, well, I stand before Allah and all of my good deeds are put on one side and all of my bad deeds are put on the other side and there is this great judgment. And if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I go to heaven. And Joe says, what happens if your bad deeds outweigh your good? And he said, Imad's countenance fell a bit and he says, well, then I go to hell. And Joe said, that really concerns me for you. And Ahmad says, why? And he goes, because you are living your whole life fearful of the bad things that could happen to you. Well, that prompted Ahmad to shoot the question back at Joe. What does your religion teach? And Joe said, there will be a judgment, but it's not going to be my good deeds outweighing my bad deeds or my bad deeds outweighing the good. Instead, I recognize I have bad deeds and Almighty God has come to take the penalty for me already so that anybody that trusts in Him will stand before God and the righteousness of Christ will be given to that person. It's a very different kind of judgment. And Imad was interested. Why am I telling you this? There is a place for us to recognize who Jesus is. You know, we see it over and over again in the book of John. We hear John the Baptist saying, Look, here comes the, the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. Prophecy after prophecy gets fulfilled. There's this guy, he was a commodities trader, a guy named Mark Ritchie, he's also an author, but he talks about how he was at his hometown, he's walking through a cemetery, and he said it just hit him like a ton of bricks, you know? That by his death, 
people are set free from their guilt and their shame. And this guy, Richie, is, Mark Richie, is talking about how he goes, you know, as I'm reading through things in the Bible, as I'm thinking back about my own life, I think, man, Jesus has been consistent regularly doing and fulfilling all the things that he says he's going to do and fulfill. And so uh, Mark Ritchie decided, maybe I can trust him in this too. You know, instead of saying, God, prove yourself to me somehow, he said, maybe I'll just trust that the things that you said are right. I'll just go your way. And he said, in that moment, too, he found Jesus to be faithful. That he found a kind of freedom from his own guilt and shame. That he recognized, man, this is what it means to be in Christ. Have you ever come to that place in your own life? Where you stop saying, God, prove yourself to me. And instead you say, God, I see where you have been faithful over and over again. And so the next thing that you ask me to do, I'll trust you in. And the next, and the next, and the next. One of the things that we see in Scripture is that it is important that we call on the name of the Lord for ourselves that we ask God for forgiveness and we declare him to be the Lord of our lives. Have you ever done that? If you haven't, would you do it today? What I'm talking about is implementing all the things we've been talking about. You don't have to come down front and talk to me as the preacher but it is vitally important that you talk to Almighty God and get some things straight with Him. So we're going to sing one more song. And during the song, what I'm inviting you to do is to talk to God, to get those things straight, to call on His name and be saved, understand what it means to have freedom and grace and, and purpose that is given by God in your life. Now, I will stand down front, and if you want somebody to talk to or you want somebody to pray for you, I'm glad to do that. You're welcome to come down and talk to me. But I'm inviting you to talk to God.
God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. please be seated. Um, I, I want to just mention to you this, this position, this town hall meeting. Um, the church asked me to come saying, we know there are some things that we want to do differently. We know we need to be reaching some younger families. There's some work to be done there. And so as I have kind of gotten in and started looking around at things, we have got kind of an unusual process in the church where just about everything comes to the pastor. And so we need to make some changes in order to make a system that is a little more, I don't know how to say it, easier to use for people, a little more user-friendly might be the right way to say that, um, where there are more channels that people can go to, people for help and, and that sort of thing. And so this town hall meeting today is to talk through that, to say this is how this person that we want to hire is going to help us in that process. And I value your ideas and your input. And so, so I'm, my plan is to come in here and we're going to share a little bit. I'm bringing in uh, somebody who is kind of an expert in church administration. And so he's going to be here to be part of that conversation with us but if you don't come and you don't participate in the dialogue, then you may not understand what it is that we're doing exactly, and we may not benefit from the ideas that you have. So I just want, I'm trying to be very upfront and very clear about all of these things. I value your ideas and opinions. I just need you there in order to get those. Um, it is important enough to me that I'm going to stay in the sanctuary just for a few minutes after worship. If for some reason you can't come but you'd like to talk about those things, then I'm, I'm trying to make myself available to you. So I will be here and we can talk a little bit if you want to do that before you slip into our Bible study time. Um, if you are not a church person, you haven't been involved in Bible study, I would really highly recommend it. I think we all need a small group of people who we can talk to and be real with, and that's what our Bible studies are really all about. And so please stay and be a part of this next hour with us. Bill, would you come and, and pray for us, and then we will be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for our pastor. We pray that this meeting he's having will re will bring great rewards for the church. I also pray for the people of the church that as we leave here today that you will go with each one of us. And when we need you, you will be there to help us and guide us through our day. Just remember, all you got to do for God is say, God, help me, and he will. In his name I pray. Amen.